Let me preface my talk with this. I'm not a preacher. I'm not an evangelist. I'm not a teacher or a Bible scholar really either. But I am a redeemed child of the King. And with that, I have something to share with you through his power and through his grace. If I look like I'm gonna faint, hopefully I don't, but I know we have some medical people here that will come to my aid. And yes, my knees are knocking, so that's probably what you're hearing. <laughs> and if I lose my place or repeat myself, forgive me. But I do have to remember a few things. One, God doesn't call the qualified, he qualifies the called. So I trust in that. And as Philippians 4.13 says, anybody? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So today I'm talking about trusting in his faithfulness. And some of the things I'm going to talk about are kind of familiar if you were here at Sabbath school class because Val kind of talked about some of those things. Isn't that how God works? So we'll start at the beginning. In the beginning, your beginning, my beginning, we were knit in our mother's womb. Knit in our mother's womb, that's how the NIV puts it. I found that interesting. If you think about God knitting, he's preparing. He was thinking about how he was gonna create each one of us. And for you men who do woodworking or us women who maybe sew, knit, crochet, quilt, the first thing we do is we think about what we want to create, how we want it to look, and we create a pattern for that. And then we get the supplies and put them together. You know, God thought about what color hair you would have and what color eyes you would have and what your smile would look like and how bright your eyes would look. And he took such pleasure in that creation. And Let's go to Psalm 139, 13 through 18. And it says, for you formed my inward parts. This is the New King James. You covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works, and that my soul knows well, very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed, and in your book they were all written, the days fashioned for me, when yet there were none of them. How precious are your thoughts to me, O oh God. How great is the thump, sum of them. If I should count them, they would be more in number than the sand. When I awake, I am still with you. What a beautiful psalm. When you think about how God created us fearfully and wonderfully made. His thought and his care for us. Anyone who's been to the ocean and has looked at the sand of the sea, to think about God's thoughts towards us being as many as the sea of the sand. I can't even take a small tablespoon of sand and have a thought for each pebble there. So I can't even imagine the vastness of that. In Luke 12, 7, if you want to turn there, it says that the very hairs on our head are all numbered. Well, you know, some of our hairs are numbered more than others, and mine, as I get older, are less and less. But that's okay. But that's just how God pays attention to every little thing in our lives, even the hairs on our head. In Jeremiah 1.5, God says to Jeremiah, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. He knew each one of us, our personalities, our struggles, our form. Before you were born, I sanctified you. I ordained you a prophet to the nations. 
Jeremiah had his reservations at first, but God reassured him. We have our reservations. I had my reservations that even this morning, but God reassured me. God reassures us. Throughout the ages, God's been faithful to reassure each one of us of his love and his faithfulness. It must have been joyful and painful at the same time when God created us. Joyful because he loves each one of us so much and painful because he knew we were coming into a sinful world with many trials, many temptations, and much pain. He also knew that some of us would accept his gift and the sacrifice of Christ Jesus made on our behalf but others, even as he was creating them, would reject his gift, his love, his son. And I'm remiss, just reminded myself, or he did, that I didn't pray yet. So let's bow our heads for a moment of prayer. Father God, I thank you so much, Lord, for the Sabbath day, for each person here, for your Holy Spirit. We praise you, Lord, that we can come here today and worship you, the creator, the sustainer, the redeemer. Bless us, Lord, as we hear your words from on high. May only your words be heard. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. I knew I'd forget something. As he created Adam from the dust of the ground and Eve from the rib of Adam, he knew what would transpire. That's where it went terribly wrong, isn't it? After creation. Just as iniquity was found in Lucifer, it would also be found in Adam and Eve and you and me, sadly. Adam and Eve lived in a unimaginable be beauty, a beautiful garden. They walked and they talked with the creator. They saw him. They listened to the beauty of his voice and saw the love in his face and his eyes. How could they not know and understand the depth of that love and fully trust that? I can't understand it, but at some point they didn't. This is where trust on this earth was first lost. Eve wandered, Eve questioned, Eve doubted, and then Eve sinned, and Adam followed suit. She listened to the lies of Satan and believed that God, the God, the God who created her, the God who loved her, was holding something back from her, some precious gift, because she believed Satan's lies. In Patriarchs and Prophets, chapter 2, The Temptation and Fall, it says, Our parents were not left without warning of the danger that threatened them. Heavenly messengers open to them the history of Satan's fall and his plot for their destruction. He could have access to them only at the forbidden tree and should they attempt to investigate its nature, they would be exposed to his wiles. They walked right into the trap. Unmindful of the angel's caution, she, Eve, soon found herself gazing with mingled curiosity and admiration upon the forbidden tree. Of course, the fruit was beautiful, the tree was beautiful. God created it. She questioned with herself, why had God withheld this from me? Now was the tempter's opportunity. And that happens in our lives too, why? We ask why, and then we start to question things, and then we start to doubt. But Adam and Eve were not ignorant of Satan's devices or of God's requirement. But Eve wandered and she wondered and listened to the lies and she distrusted. Then Adam distrusted and took of the tree as well. He didn't trust that God would and could provide for him another mate, someone else to love. All he could see is his understanding of the situation. Then, when evil, the evil was revealed to them, can you imagine? All of a sudden, you can see evil. You know, there's an expression, ignorance is bliss. And sometimes I wish that I couldn't see 
the, it, the evil before me. Couldn't see the pain that people go through. Couldn't see what God is suffering every time he looks upon this earth. The angels, all of heaven. The pain. The sadness. In the book of Education, page 27, we read, But man was not abandoned to the results of evil he had chosen. In the sentence pronounced upon Satan was given an intimation of redemption. This sentence spoken in the hearing of the first parents was to them a promise. Before they heard of the thorn and the thistle, the toil and the sorrow that must be their portion, or of the dust to which they must return, they listened to words that could not fail of giving them hope. Praise the Lord, he always gives us hope. All that has been lost by yielding to Satan could be regained through Christ Jesus. John 3.16 tells us, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. And God knew what his son was going to have to go through. And I think about that. I have one son, a miracle that God gave me, that I was never supposed to be able to have. And I think, would I send my son into a place where I knew people were going to abuse him and beat him and kill him? No. I don't have a love like that. I can't understand a love like that. But praise the Lord in his faithfulness to them and to us in Jesus. So I ask you, friends, how's your trust today? We all struggle with it. We all question. And we all lean on our own understanding at times. Do you run to him when you are fearful or when you're distrusting? Or do you run away, as Adam and Eve did, as I tend to do? Psalm 62, 8 says, Trust in him at all times, you people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. And we know and love Romans 8, 38 and 39 through 39. And it's quite a promise, for I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing, nothing can separate us from that love. He loves us. We can't even separate ourselves from that love. Even if we walk away, what does that say? I have loved you with an everlasting love, Jeremiah 31, 3. Everlasting. You know, and I think about that sometimes, and I think, so does that mean for all of eternity, after a thousand years, we'll forget some things that happened maybe on this earth, sin, but for all eternity, everlasting, God will miss those who are not there because he loves them with an everlasting love. Let's take a look at today's verse in Proverbs 3, 5 and 7. 5 through 7, I'm sorry. I haven't fainted yet. <laughs> Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. It will be health to your flesh and strength to your bones. Trust. I think trust in the words trust and faith are synonymous. Trust in the Lord, have faith in the Lord. And as I was reading different texts, I could put the word faith or the word trust, depending on what I was reading, in there. Trust is just letting go, giving it to God, believing. It's belief. With all your heart. Now, I don't know how to give all my heart. I try, and I do it over and over again. And he knows that I want him to have all my heart. 
The leaning on your own understanding, that's a problem, I think, for most of us. Because the very first thing when something happens is what do we do? We think through the scenario. How's it going to end up? What should I do? But he says, in all your ways, every issue, everything that comes up, acknowledge him. Wait a minute. God has this. My God has this. Acknowledge him in all your ways. And he'll direct your paths. And that's usually what we're praying about, right? We're praying for direction. We need to know what to do. What does he want us to do? What's the best thing to do? Because I know if I just step out without his counsel, without praying, I'm going to trip and I'm going to fall. And then I'm going to have to come back and do what he asked me to do in the first place. (laughs) Do not be wise in your own eyes. We think we know. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. It will be health to your flesh and strength to your bones. That's a promise. Now, as I said, the leaning on your own understanding is a problem that I have. Growing up, I learned, at, and trusting, growing up, I learned at a very early age not to trust. Not to trust anyone. Not to trust those that were supposed to love me and I was supposed to love. When things would go wrong, I would run and I would hide. I didn't want to deal with it. I couldn't deal with it. So as a result of all of that, I struggle with anxiety. That's why to be here standing in front of you is really a miracle of God because anxiety puts me into panic attacks at times. But I was living in a home with a ticking time bomb. Never knew when it would go off. So you walked kind of on very tenderly because you didn't want to touch it off. But as a result, living in an environment like that, I grew very rebellious, very angry, and very destructive, self-destructive. Because I listened to the promptings of evil, repeating the degrading sentiments which I grew up hearing and believing. It's sad, but it's so much easier for all of us to believe a lie than the truth. Satan's good at disguising words and using words to tear us down. And he uses people, hurting people. Praise God, he didn't leave me there, though. When I was 24 years old, I was diagnosed with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Some of you know this story. But it was the beginning of my healing. Sounds odd that cancer was the beginning of my healing, but God will use the darkest times in our lives, the most difficult times, to bring us healing and restoration. If he knows that's what it's going to take, he'll allow it. That's what he did for me. And that's when he stepped into my life and started to show me his faithfulness. Let's turn to Psalm 23. Say amen when you get there. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I love that psalm. I used to think it was a psalm about death, because that's how it's always used. But there was a time in my life when I was praying about something, And God brought me to that psalm, and he opened up the joy of it, the beauty of it to me. It's really beautiful. When he talks about green pastures, 
when it says he makes me lie down in green pastures, I think of it as he welcomes me to, he brings me to, and invites me to. But it reminds me of one time, even before I knew him, that he was very faithful to me. It was the beginning of his teaching me his faithfulness. He gave me a beautiful dream. I had been diagnosed with cancer. The doctors told my parents it was the last stages of the disease and I would probably be, only live for maybe a month or more. My liver and my spleen were filled with cancer. I looked about six months pregnant, so you can imagine the cancer that was riddling my body. My cousin had died of leukemia the day I was diagnosed with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. My family was broken, and they all looked at me with sadness, expecting I was the next to go. But one night, I went to sleep, and I had a dream that could only have come from God. In that dream, I was in the air, and I was neither ascending or descending. But there was a presence with me. I did, couldn't see the presence, but I could feel the presence. The presence of peace, of joy, of beauty. And I was looking down upon the earth made new. But the odd thing was, when I looked down upon the earth, I knew what I was looking at, even though it was, I knew where I was looking. There was a plot of land where I grew up, and it had hills and rocks, and it was not a a pretty piece of land. It's now a strip mall. But I was looking down at that place. How I knew that, I don't know. And it was covered with green grass that looked like velvet. It was vivid colors, and the sky was so blue. It was almost blinding how vivid these colors were. And I was filled, every cell and every atom in my body was filled with peace. Nothing I've ever experienced, just peace that filled my soul completely. And I was at rest. And I was so blessed. And that was the end of the dream. Now, maybe it was because I saw the earth made new and God was saying that he was going to make me new. But I knew when I woke up that what he was telling me was that I was not going to die from cancer. When I told my family that, of course, they thought I had lost my mind. And um, they didn't really believe me. But, um, and the odd thing was I hadn't even really been introduced to him yet. But he was reaching out to me, showing me the love that I did not deserve. He comforted me as I walked through the valley of the shadow of death. I often say that cancer was one of the greatest gifts I've ever been given. For without it, I would have died. Does that make sense? Not really. It's, sounds ironic, but it's true. My habits, my inclinations were of the world, completely. I tried to party myself to death because I wanted to die. I would scream at God, loud and audible and say, why did you create me? Why did you allow me to be born? I didn't ask for this, and I would yell at him, and I would be angry, but he was still faithful. Cancer made me wanna live, where before I lived my life to die. I wouldn't commit suicide, but I would try my hardest to kill myself just through the way I lived my life. However, I was introduced to the Seventh-day Adventist faith by my faithful aunt, the aunt who everybody in the family said was weird because she gave God her money. She's poor and she's giving God her money and she prays all the time and she keeps Saturday for, instead of Sunday, she goes to church on Saturday. She was very sweet and she was very persistent. She would call me every week and say, you coming to church with us this week? No, auntie, I'm not. 
No one at church is going to want me to be at church. She would keep asking like the woman that went to the king. And finally, I said, okay, okay, I'll go with you. But I knew what to expect. I had, not, I had found nothing but rejection and hurt in this world. That church is not going to be any different. Except what I found when I walked in were people who had been praying for me because she told them about me. People who came up to me and welcomed me and made me feel loved for the probably one of the first times strangers and this isn't in my notes but I looked at the crowd and there were two people I knew I thought what are they doing here because they were you know living in the world like I was and to see them in church was pretty strange so I talked to them and I asked them and they told me that they had found Jesus and they went on about the love and the joy they found and how their lives were changed. And of course it surprised me and made me start to think, maybe there is something to this. And so I started to have Bible studies and I loved those studies. God had opened up my heart through these people, through his Holy Spirit, opened up my heart to love and every study that I read, it was just food for my soul. I loved it. And then I had the study on the life of Christ. And it broke me. Because I could relate to his pain. I could relate to the fact that he suffered unjustly. That he was beaten when he didn't deserve it. He was spat upon as I was. He knew who I was. He knew my pain. He suffered worse than me, and he had no reason to suffer until I realized why he was suffering. For me, for you, for every person ever created, even the ones who would turn away and would not love him back, would not accept that gift. It's heartbreaking. His life broke mine, and I gave my life to him that night. And I woke up in the morning feeling at peace. Anger was gone. I still had issues and problems because of how my life had gone. There were still ingrained problems. And the old uh, habits were strong. For a time, things went well. I would go to church and I would love what I was learning and I loved hearing about Jesus. But unfortunately, the old habits were strong and the people who were around me were the people from the world. I didn't have a support system in the church. Um, I didn't have friends in the church. And I think that's where we go wrong. When people come into the church, we need to befriend them make them part of everything that we're doing. I know in the past year or so, I've become really close with the Jacobs and the Sweets and the Calendars, and I just feel a part of their families, and it just brings me so much peace. I feel a part of this congregation, this church, and I'm so blessed by that, and I thank you for the love that you show me. But sadly and slowly, I compromised my daily activities and I was drawn back into a life of darkness. I was like the description in Matthew 13, 20. But he who received the word on stony places, this is he who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Because I did, I was full of joy. I was telling everybody about Jesus. Yet he has no root in himself, but endures only for a while. For when tribulation or persecution or the questions of your friends or the um, comments from your friends and family arise because of the world, immediately he stumbles and I stumbled. I was leaning on my own understanding, figuring I knew what would make me happy. Yeah, I could have God and I could have the world too, right? Mm, it doesn't work that way. I figured marriage and friends, they came before God. 
I didn't know him well enough yet to trust him with my whole life. Because remember, I didn't have very much trust and I haven't learned much yet. So I followed what I knew and what I was familiar with and I moved away from home and I got married. Wasn't that gonna make me happy? Wasn't that gonna fill the emptiness I felt? How do you think that worked out? You're right, Penny. It didn't. God, however, says that he will never leave me, you, or forsake us. He's faithful even when we're not, even when we turn away. He is steadfast, sure, and true, and he was going to teach me to trust him. He was faithful even when I wasn't, and he wanted to bring me back to him. It wasn't long before living back in the world and doing the things that I used to do. Conviction came, and the Holy Spirit started to work on my heart again and reveal to me how awful I was, how sad it was that I left the joy that I knew. Even my family, when I would call them and talk to them on the phone and they would hear how sad and miserable I was, they would say, why don't you go back to church? When you were in church, you were really happy. I, I was like, what? Hearing this from my family? Okay. But I soon did realize how dark I was and how unfaithful I was to him. And praise God, he can be trusted and deserves my trust. It would be another lesson in his faithfulness, his worthiness. Psalm 28, 7 says, The Lord is my strength and shield. My heart trusted in him and I am helped. Therefore my heart greatly rejoices with, and with my song I will praise him. And Psalm 91 too. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God, in him I will trust. As I prayed, weeping on the ground, uh, just weeping, for brokenness, he and I had a conversation. And I said, Lord, I'm coming back to church. I know that's where you want me. I know that's home. But I had just moved to Maryland. I didn't know where any of the churches were, but there was a little church just down the road, a non-denominational church. I'm going to go to that church on Sunday. I said, I don't think Sabbath really matters. You don't really care whether I go to church on Sunday or Saturday, right? But, Lord, this is exactly what I said to him. If it matters to you, I'm going to trust that you're going to let me know. Ha! Huh. <laughs> God is faithful. That Sunday, I went and I attended that non-denominational church. And it was a lovely service. At the end of the service, though, they made an announcement. We have a surprise for you today. Pastor Hagar Thomas from the local Seventh-day Adventist Church is here downstairs in our fellowship room, and he's here to share his faith. I thought, what? No, this is a joke. No one ever invites a Seventh-day Adventist pastor into a Sunday-keeping church to talk about the Sabbath. And I, even at that moment, I didn't think this was, so, this was God speaking to me. I thought, I'm going to go downstairs and see what he has to say. I went downstairs, <clears throat> and when he walked in the room, <laughs> I should have known then, he was surrounded with the light of Christ. He really glowed with the Holy Spirit. He was a tall Texan man. Looked like Kenny Rogers, for any of you who might know who Kenny Rogers was, is. I don't know if he's still alive or not. But he came in and he sat down and people, he started talking, and people asked him questions and everything he said just rolled off his tongue like butter. It was just smooth and perfect. And I sat there <laughs> surrendering. Okay, Lord, I get it, I get it. You sent him here for me. And at the end of the service, when he was standing there, people were all around him, so I really couldn't get to him. Enough to say, the only thing I could say to him was, I'm a backslidden Adventist, 
and you really spoke to my heart, and I left. And I went on vacation here to Maine for two weeks. He didn't know my name, he didn't know who I was, but he heard what I said, and he and his congregation were praying for me. When I came back from Maine, uh, I went for a ride to wonder where this church was, and really it was only maybe a mile more down the road than the Sunday keeping church. And it was a Wednesday night and I drove by and the lights were on. So I thought, oh, I'll stop in and see who's in there. So I stopped and I went in and the pastor happened to walk out of the congregation, uh, out of the sanctuary at the time. And he was shocked to see me and so happy. We've been praying for you. We didn't know who you were. We didn't know how to contact you. We've just been praying that somehow you would come. And there I was. He invited me in and they were having a Bible study. <laughs> oh, how faithful God is. I'm not gonna cry, <laughs> although my heart wants to right now. <clears throat> As I walked into the church, <clears throat> excuse me, they were studying the desire of ages. And if you read the chapter called The Divine Shepherd, what was I? I was a lost sheep. Chapter 51, page 479, and this is what they were reading when I sat down. Jesus knows us individually and is touched with the feelings of our infirmities. He knows us all by name. He knows the very house which each and every one of you live in, the name of every person in your home. He has at times given direction to his servant to go to a certain street in a certain city to a certain house to find one of his lost sheep. Well, in my case, he sent his servant to go to a certain church on a certain street on a certain day to find this lost sheep. Me? Remember, I was told I was worthless. I was nothing. Why would God, why would this God care about me enough to tell me that he wants me home, that he wants me back? I was nothing. But to him, I was everything. And Pastor Thomas later revealed to me that he and his wife were also on vacation and they came back early. And that the person who was supposed to speak, they were having a series of people coming into that Sunday keeping church. And the person that was supposed to speak that day was a priest, a Catholic priest. But the Catholic priest, something happened to him. I don't recall what, whether he was sick or something came up. He couldn't make it. <laughs> well, I know what happened. So Pastor Thomas was called. Now you may be familiar with the last name Thomas his son's name is Jerry Thomas, the book The Messiah, and um, Shoebox Kids, is it? Some books that he wrote, children's books. He has since passed, and I wrote him a letter when I realized who he was once and told him about his father and what his father had done uh, in my walk with Christ, and he was happy to hear that. He knew, God knew, because of all my pain and because of my lack of trust that he was gonna to have to prove to me, to show me that he loved me and that his love could fill my heart and satisfy me. He was willing to prove that to me and he did and he does it now every day to each one of us. In one way or another, he proves his love to us if we look and, and open our eyes and our heart to him. Such a beautiful gift. The leaning not on your own understanding part of the verse is still a challenge for me, though less and less, the more I learn to trust him. And he teaches me all the time. He teaches all of us all the time. I had a stem cell transplant in December of 99 into 2000. I thought for sure then that I would die and I was at peace. I had no strength, but God was still with me. I would lay in my bed, not really even able to get out, out of bed, and there's a star that would shine brightly every night. And I would just think of, you know, God created that star and he put that star right there 
to give me hope somehow. It gave me hope and strength. And I had a faithful husband who would come up to my room every day and he'd say, you need to get dressed. No, 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 I can't get dressed, I'm too weak. You need to get dressed, come on, we're gonna get you dressed, we're gonna go outside, you're gonna take in some fresh air for as long as you can and then you can go back to bed. And little by little, I got stronger. Yes, the trials continued in my life, but with each one, God continues to be faithful. He continues to show me that he can tr I can trust him. He pursues all of us as he did Adam and Eve. He didn't let Adam and Eve run off and just forget about them because they sinned. No. He followed them. He pursued them. He comforted them. Through the years, I've learned that although my inclination is to run when faced with trial, and some of you know this, some of my friends like Penny, <laughs> She knows I tend to hide when I'm feeling worthless, when I'm listening to Satan's lies. I may still come to church, but I might sit in the back or I might isolate myself or I might not really talk to anybody because I'm feeling so heavy. But then I come here, even though I might not have wanted to, and I, God lifts that heaviness and I feel, I feel healed. <clears throat> I have learned that this life as a Christian is not about me at all. And that's the miracle that I'm learning. You see, because when you grow up with dysfunction and pain, all you think about is yourself and everything that's going to affect you, how everything around you affects you. And then as you give your life to Christ and surrender to him, you start to really realize it is not about me. I'm given the privilege to live through him and him through me, really. I'm learning to love like him. I'm learning to forgive like him. I'm learning to set my judgments aside. My opinions don't matter. What matters is his opinion. And yes, I do trip up and I probably still will. But he brings me back. Second Peter 1 4 says, by which we have been given to us exceeding great and precious promises. That's what I lean on. I have to claim those promises. I have to look them up, read them, study them, and claim them. That through these you may be partakers of the divine nature. And isn't that what we all want? We want to be partakers of his nature. Because when our nature rears its ugly head, we hate it, don't we? we say to ourselves, oh, why did you do that? Why did you say that? And we repent, and he doesn't leave us, and he heals us. That's the key to peace, holding on to his precious promises. Oh, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Lust, what I want. Claiming those promises, praying those promises, wearing them around your neck. Proverbs 3.3. 3. I wanted my story to be in all of this, but I wanted his word to be first and foremost. So there's a lot of verses, a lot of promises. Proverbs 3.3 3 says, let love and faithfulness never leave you. Bind them around your neck, wear them on the tablet of your heart. 1 Corinthians 10.13. No temptation has overtaken you except such as common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted be beyond what you're able, but with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. Isaiah 26, 3. You will keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. In closing, Let's go back to Psalm 139, starting in verse 1 through 6. Kind of a little recap, I guess. <clears throat> oh Lord, you have searched me and know me, definitely. 
You know my sitting down and my rising up. You understand my thought afar off. In our walk with the Lord, he knows all the pain and the trials you've been through. He knows your heart. You comprehend my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. He knows the paths we take and walks with us to guide us and to redirect us. For there's not a word on my tongue, but behold, O Lord, you know it all together. There's nothing that we can hide from him. You have hedged me behind and before and laid your hand upon me, his hand of healing and protection. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain it. I've had this cancer now for 42 years. I've gone in and out of remission, but he's always given me strength. And he's always taught me something of his love in each time I've had to go through that. And he's always laid his healing hand upon me. Against all odds and predictions, I'm still here by his grace. He's still working on me. Amen. Amen. Where can I go from your spirit? I can run, but I can't hide. Or where can I flee from your presence? Praise the Lord, nowhere. If I ascend into heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, you are there. He's constantly pursuing us. If I take wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. We cannot hide from him even when we run. He is there loving, caring, and guiding. He, the God of all creation, pursuing us. If I say, surely the darkness shall fall on me, even the night shall be light about me. Indeed, the darkness shall not hide from you, but the night shines as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike to you. He's got it under control. Life moved on. I ended up in Maine. I have a son that I was told I'd never have. And yes, we'll all live happily ever after eventually, won't we? Christ will come and bring us home and we'll learn so much about the lessons and all that took place here on this earth. We'll learn so much about the depth of his love. And like the song said, just when I need him, Jesus is near. Just when I falter, just when I fear. He's ready to help me, ready to cheer, just when I need him most. So, trust, believe, have faith in the Lord, our creator, sustainer, redeemer, with all your heart, even when it's difficult. Don't lean on your own understanding. His ways are not our ways. Trust his wisdom. Acknowledge him in everything you do. Keep your eyes on him, and he will, and that's a promise, direct your path. But I still have a few other verses. <laughs> Hebrews 20, 10, 23. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful, his faithfulness. May God fully enrich your walk with him and reveal to you his ever-present faithfulness. May the God of all grace, who called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a while, perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. May the Lord bless and keep you, make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. <laughs>